So Marlise is already our fourth uh, student speaker. Uh, she is a master's student at the Cognitive Neuroscience uh, Research Master here in Nijmegen. And um, she's already becoming a pro in creating these awesome pictures. Her research was uh, in a collaboration between Radboud UMC and the Neuropathology Department in Oxford. So uh, for part of her research she, uh, she did here and the other part she, did, um, uh, she went to Oxford to do, uh, to do it. Um, her research focuses on hippocampal white matter alterations in patients with ALS and FTD. Uh, the patients with ALS, which is a motor neuron disease, also exhibit cognitive problems. And she works specifically with a new technique, which is called polarized light imaging. It creates really, really awesome pictures. So that's why she's becoming a pro in making pictures. And uh, you can visualize uh, white matter with this uh, technique in really great detail. So please give her an applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the really kind introduction and thank you for having me here. Um, like Amy said, today I'll be telling you something about white matter alterations in uh, the hippocampus in patients with ALS and FTD. And to investigate this, we've used both diffusion MRI as well as uh, polarized light microscopy. Uh, since polarized light microscopy is quite a new technique, I'll also be telling you something about how it works today. Uh, and the picture you see in the background is actually a picture that was created with that technique. Um, like I said, I'll be telling you something about uh, patients with ALS and FTD. ALS stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which is a very severe motor disease. Um, it's caused by degeneration of motor neurons in both the spinal cord as well as in the brain. But what is less known, and what Amy just told you, is that uh, about 50% of the patients also exhibit cognitive problems, where 10 to 20% of the people actually meet the criteria for frontotemporal lobe dementia, or FTD. Um, and in comparison to a healthy population, um, in healthy populations, this uh, FTD um, has a risk of uh, less than 1%, so your risk is really enhanced when you have ALS. Um, Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong direction. Um, FCD or frontotemporal lobe dementia is a very heterogeneous form of dementia. Um, it's manifested mo mostly in the frontal and temporal lobes, as the name says. And there are three different tops, subtypes, uh, semantic uh, FTD, progressive non-fluent FTD, and behavioral FTD. And behavioral FTD is the variant that also co-occurs with ALS. So from now on, when I'll be talking about FTD, it's about behavioral FTD. Um, and what's interesting, oh, yeah, I'm going to turn this around. Uh, <laughs> what's interesting is that uh, besides the fact that these diseases co-occur, there's also a similarity in protein pathology between the two. Uh, so you've got this protein called uh, TDP43. And uh, when you're healthy, it's mostly present in the nucleus as a transcription factor. But in these diseases, uh, this protein gets phosphorylated and therefore it can aggregate outside of the nucleus. Uh, you can compare this with the amyloid beta aggregations in ALS that can cause uh, neuronal damage. Um, and uh, you see these protein inclusions in both diseases. And in FCD, these inclusions spread from the front to the back, while in ALS, they spread from the back to the front. Um, but what's interesting is when you look at the regions where you see this protein, um, they uh, have relationship in that sense that they occur in the circuit of Papin, which is depicted over here with the arrows. Um, it's a major loop in the limbic system that's involved in, um, amongst other things, episodic memory. And one important path Again, <laughs> one important path within this uh, circuit is the perfect path. This runs through the hippocampus and is also involved in episodic memory consolidation and retrieval. Um, and it's been implicated in both ALS and FTD. Um, it runs from the entorhinal cortex to the subiculum into the dentate gyrus. Um, and uh, like I said, it's important in episodic memory consolidation, which also links it to the FTD. Um, but what we hypothesis, hope, hypothesize is that degeneration of this path is one of the key features uh, that shows the overlap between ALS and behavioral FTD. Um, and to investigate these white matter alterations, we performed several methods. 
Uh, we started by sampling hippocampal blocks from five control patients and 14 ALS or ALS FTD patients. Ideally, we would also have a cohort with behavioral FTD patients. However, uh, we're using brains that come from the brain bank in Oxford. And so far, they haven't uh, gotten these behavioral FTD brains yet. They haven't uh, collected them yet. So it would be nice to elaborate this study in the future also with the behavioral FTD brains. Um, after sampling, we've scanned all blocks with diffusion MRI. And after diffusion MRI, we split the sample into two parts. One we use for histology and the other one for polarized light imaging, which is a new microscopy technique that Amy was telling you about. Um, and what we also did is we uh, co-registered the PLI data with the diffusion MRI data so that we could actually compare the techniques one on one because the regions that we're looking at are actually overlapping in our data. So we sort of shifted uh, the data to match each other as you can see over here. Um, then because polarized light imaging is such a new technique, I'll tell you something about how it works. Uh, it makes use of the property that myelin uh, can break light when you shine light on it and gray matter does not. So if you use uh, light with one direction, also called polarized light, um, you can see how the light is shifted after it passes through your tissue. Uh, and from that you can extract information about the myelin itself. And by using this rotating polarizer up here, you can actually extract both the amount of myelin as well as the direction of the myelin in a very high resolution. Um, so it gives you images with a four micrometer resolution, which is around the size of a neuron. So it's really impressive. Um, this may be a bit abstract, so I uh, added a picture of the raw data. This is actually um, just a normal light microscope. Um, so the color changes you see are really due to that uh, polarizing effect of the breaking effect of the myelin. Uh, this is a corpus callosum and by uh, rotating the polarizer you look for uh, amounts of myelin in different directions. And you can really see that in one direction that's likely the same direction as the plane, uh, the myelin really becomes bright. Um, and from this we extract uh, other data, for example uh, these fiber orientation maps where the intensity of the color indicates the amount of myelin and the color itself indicates the direction of the myelin. So you can actually see the direction and the intensity in one picture. Um, so here uh, this color wheel shows you what the directions are. Uh, left to right is uh, colored red and uh, blue is up and down. So here uh, in the middle you should see a bit more red while here it's going a bit up. Uh, so it's yellow and here it's purple because it's going up in the other direction. Um, our, this is data from the corpus callosum, but we're working with the hippocampus. So our data looks like this. Um, also quite pretty, I think. Mm -hmm. And you can, for example, really see how this fiber bundle is going around by the changing colors. Um, another metric that we can extract from this technique is the retardance. And the retardance shows you how much... Um, the light is shifted actually due to the interaction with the myelin. So it's an indirect measure of how much myelin is present. Um, so you can also see that here in white matter regions, the maps are more intense than here in gray matter regions. Uh, and we'll be using uh, this map for the rest of our analyses. Um, then the other technique that we use is diffusion MRI. I don't know if everybody's familiar with it, so I'll give a small introduction about it. Um, diffusion MRI relies on the property that, uh, oh, sorry, uh, that uh, water diffuses uh, more uh, easily alongside the direction of an axon contrary to through an axon. So if you have two axons here, water will likely diffuse in that way and not in that direction. Um, so you can uh, estimate the direction of the water diffusion and thereby um, gain information about myelin. Um, there are two main um, metrics that we can extract from this data. The first one is the mean diffusivity, which gives you information about how much diffusion there is in general. And the idea is then that when white matter is degenerating, water can move more freely, so the MD values goes up. And the other one is the fractional anisotropy, and that says something about how directed the diffusion is. So FA is higher when... Um, water is moving more in one direction. And the idea is that when axons are, de are degenerating, um, diffusion becomes more spread, so the FA goes down. 
Um, and then you can also see here that in the corpus callosum, the FA is very high, while the MD is uh, very low. Um, when we then move on to the results, we see that uh, if we uh, compute the FA and MD over this perfect path that we extracted from the diffusion MRI, that there's indeed an in a decrease in the FA value in ALS patients compared to controls, and that we see an increase in the MD, MD value uh, again in ALS patients compared to controls. So this is really, oh, sorry, <laughs> this is really um, in concordance with our hypothesis. Um, then we wanted to see if we would also see this effect in the retardance maps that I just told you about. So these are the retardance maps uh, over the path that we extracted with the diffusion MRI and we were able to directly couple this by co-registering the data. Um, and what we then see is a decrease in retardance in the ALS patients, however it's not significant. Uh, so what we're planning on doing is we've now analyzed one slice of the PLI, but we still have 11 more. So we'll analyze those 11 as well, and then we hope to see whether this is a true effect or not. Um, and here you can also see by eye already that in controls here runs the perfect path, which is indicated by the yellow arrows, that it's uh, clearer compared to the ALS patients. Um, this is not as clear in every case because otherwise this effect would be bigger, but just to give you an idea of how the data looks. Um, then we were interested in whether this retardance value actually tells us what we think it tells us, because this technique is now seven years old and it's actually never been used to compare cases with controls. So it's quite experimental what we're doing. So we wanted to see if uh, the retardance values correlate with the metrics that we find with the diffusion MRI, because that's a very well established technique. And what we then see is that if the retardance goes down, that the uh, MD values actually go up, which makes sense because if MD values go up, there's more diffusion, so less myelin. So we expect also that the retardance then goes down. Um, so this is, uh, this is good that we see this. Uh, however, we do not find a correlation with the fractional anisotropy. Uh, which at first may seem a bit surprising. However, when you think about it, it's also possible if myelin is degrading um, in this direction in the same way as in this direction, then your FA value will stay the same, but your ND value will go up and you will still have less myelin. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that when your diffusion is less or more directed, there, there's also less or more myelin present. Um, so that's why we were less surprised that this is not correlating with diffusion MRI. But who knows, maybe if we expand the data set, this correlation will also become bigger. And then finally, we've looked at uh, histology. We've performed four stains. The first one for uh, microglial activation, which gives us a measure of the amount of inflammation. The idea is that when white matter is damaged, um, the inflammation level will go up. Um, the second stain was for PTDP43, which is the protein that uh, I told you about in the beginning that was implicated in ALS and FTD. And then finally, we performed a stain for myelin as well as for neurofilaments. Uh, myelin is the compound that is around exons, and neurofilaments are uh, compounds that actually support exons in growing and sustaining. Um, what was surprising to us is that we didn't find a change in the inflammation. Uh, because we expected that when white matters degeneration, inflammation would go up. However, it's also shown that uh, in chronic inflammation, which is the case in these patients because they died from ALS, um, that then microglia over a certain time course retract itself. Um, so maybe that's what happening. That's what happening here. Then we see two cases that exhibit TDP43 pathology within the hippocampus, within the whole brain. So for example, in the motor areas, every case exhibits this protein pathology, otherwise it wouldn't have been an ALS case. But like I said, um, in ALS, the protein pathology spreads from the back to the front. Um, so this may be a later, this may be two cases with uh, a later stage of ALS and therefore we only see it in two cases. Uh, then what was really surprising is that we see an increase in myelin in the cerebriculum. Um, which is one of the areas that is part of the perfect path. This is contradicting uh, the PLI and diffusion MRI findings, but what may be the case is that um, exons are degenerating rather than that there's demyelination, so that exons are spreading, causing sort of larger surface of myelin, but not functional myelin. 
Um, so we're planning on looking into this by using the uh, fiber orientation maps because that gives us an, a view of how the orientations of myelin are. And we then expect to see a bigger spread in the directions in the perfume path in ALS cases compared to controls. Uh, we'll look into that in two weeks. So I, yeah, I can't tell you anything about that now, but we'll see. Um, then finally, we saw a decrease in the subiculum in the amount of neurofilaments, which is um, what we also expected because less neurofilaments, less support of the axons, so axonal degeneration. But we saw an increase in the dentate gyrus, um, which is really surprising because this is then also contradicting each other. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, so what we then can conclude is that FA uh, values are lower and MD values are higher in ALS cases compared to controls, which could implicate white matter damage in the perfume path. This is further supported by the PLA, PLI retardance maps. Uh, and what I personally find very interesting is that those PLI retardance maps does correlate with the MD values, um, which I think makes it a really good technique to investigate white matter paths especially because it's so detailed. So you can literally see axon bundles uh, crossing. Um, it's way more detailed than diffusion MRI. Plus you have the information about the directionality of the fibers, which you don't have uh, when you perform diffusion MRI. Um, so I'd really recommend that if you want to investigate a wide matter pathway in detail that you would add this to your methods. Um, a drawback is that it's only in 2D while uh, diffusion MRI gives you a 3D image. Um, but I think it's a really nice complementary method to investigate white matter. Um, and then finally, we found a reduction in uh, neurofilaments in the subiculum, which also uh, attributes to our hypothesis. Uh, then there are some side notes that have to be made. Uh, first of all, we uh, used uh, control blocks. Uh, we gained them from the brain bank in Nijmegen, while the ALS cases came from the brain bank in Oxford. So the brains were sampled by different people and also brains that are part of the brain bank are usually fixated longer. So there are really tissue differences that could uh, drive the effects that we're seeing. However, we've already controlled for this because we expect that um, if longer fixation causes the changes in MD and FA that we're seeing, that then we expect those changes to be present in the whole tissue block. However, we do not see that. We see that in regions outside of the path, we don't see these differences. And we uh, actually controlled our values. We scaled them to the FA and MD values we see in other unrelated parts of the block to uh, exclude gender, age, and fixation time differences. Um, one thing that is really hard to control for, and I don't know if anybody has an idea about this, uh, but that's that um, we, uh, we sampled the control cases and uh, in Oxford they sampled the ALS cases, but we have a slight regional differences uh, difference in how the brains are sampled. So our blocks are a bit more anterior and the Oxford blocks are a bit more posterior, um, even though we use the same sampling protocol. Um, and we don't really know how we can correct for this difference in a, in a good way, because the middle part of the tissue is still overlapping, but on the sides there are some changes in region. Um, so that's something we have to take into account. Um, and then finally, what we're, what we're still waiting for is the diagnostic division within our ALS cases, because we know that we have 14 cases that are either, either pure ALS or ALS FTD. Um, and we're still waiting on uh, the diagnosis of uh, this based on neuropathology and uh, the clinical records of these patients. And once we have these, we expect that the difference that we see are higher in the patients that also have FTD. Um, then, like I said, the higher amount of myelin stain that was contradicting our results, which may be due to the axonal spread, which we're still going to investigate. Um, and that we didn't see anything in the microglia, which could be due to microglia just retracting over time when there's chronic inflammation. Um, so this is where we are right now. Um, I'd really like to thank the people that helped me both at the rubout as well as in Oxford. Um, and also I'd like to thank Istvan and Carla Miller who are from the FIMRIP in Oxford that helped us with co-registering the data, actually uh, giving us programs for that. Um, so yeah, that was it.
think due to uh, time limitations, we can have uh, time for just a couple of questions while the computer will be set up. And then uh, afterwards, we'll go to Samar. Yes? Thank you for a very interesting talk. So uh, just a quick correction. You can infer directionality from uh, DTI data if you mm -hmm. want to change the gradient. But uh, I want to point to your interesting results uh, for increased matter in the subicum. So you are expecting all the results to be driven by the degeneration of the myelin. But these people are living through many years of fighting a very serious condition where the symptoms are very, very slowly piling up. Yeah. And they have to come up with adaptive strategies and different That's also true. So I was wondering yeah. if you could consider a bit about adaptive plasticity rather than just the generation. Um, to be honest, we haven't focused on that yet, uh, but I think it's a really good suggestion because it makes sense that people are compensating when degeneration is taking place. Um, though I don't know if the hippocampal area would then be an area that you would expect that plasticity to occur. If you need, if you need more resources, you need more resources. Ah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming out of the neuron, yeah. or, or at least of the core. Uh, what kind of effect does, does that have on the neuron? Um, well, we know that it's, it has a damaging effect, just like the amyloid beta has in Alzheimer's. Uh, but we don't know whether it's a cause or a consequence of the disease, also just like in Alzheimer's. Because it's really hard to distinguish those two. But we know that it does damage. Any more questions? Okay, yeah, shall I? <laughs> <laughs>